we thought we'd show you that. Um, we were high school sweethearts, and um, this coming July we'll be celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. And we actually have been working in our dental practice together for that same amount of period, the same, the same time period. And I graduated from dental school in 1993 from the University of Alberta. But my real experience in dentistry actually began when I was 11 years old, and I started working in my dad's dental practice as his janitor. So since that time, I actually was fortunate enough to do pretty much every job that there is uh, possible in the, in the dental office, and so that's given me tremendous perspectives um, since becoming a dentist. In 1994, I graduated from uh, the U of A also, and we found that university prepared us really well for the ins and outs of patient care, but they really didn't teach us how to run a business or run a practice or deal with all the challenges that we were going to face with staff and so many other things. So we realized we lacked those tools that we needed and we found ourselves, whether it be managing our practice or serving in our church, to be lacking a whole bunch of things that we needed. We remember many a night sitting and discussing, discussing the relational problems we were having um, that we were up against in our practice as well as our church. Um, and interesting enough, they often mirrored each other. And many of us that find ourselves in leadership positions and influence over others, um, we, we find that, sorry, because of our professions, we find ourselves in leadership positions or influence over others. And that's professionally and in our churches. Um, and we are often looked to for answers. As Christians, we are called to use our God-given influence to glorify Him. And we contrast this with the world's norm of using influence to climb the bureaucratic ladder of success and power, and often to make sure the bank balance is as big as possible. We are commanded to live righteously and seek the kingdom of God above all else, upon which all the necessities of life will be provided for us. So how we do this does not come naturally or instinctively to most of us. Our dental practice is in Kilimat, and it's approximately 500 miles north of here. And if you've ever been on an Alaskan cruise, you've cruised through some of the same waters that we call our backyard, where we get the opportunity to whale watch and fish for halibut, salmon, crab, and so much more. So we feel pretty so That's in front of our boat right there. We came right under our boat. Yeah. So we called our presentation Managing Your Healthcare Practice to Authentically Reflect What You Believe. It's important to point out that although we'll be highlighting things specific to our dental practice, uh, we believe that the principles have a much wider reach than just, just healthcare. Uh, and that they can apply to numerous relationships, whether they be in our homes or the workplace or beyond. Early on in our search for answers, we had difficulty finding others that were intentionally integrating their faith and profession. And we feel that over the last 25 years, God has graciously taught us and led us um, through the challenges that we faced and encountered. So um, we want to we want to pass that on. Uh, he's placed the desires on our hearts to share the insights with others as they work to build Christ Center practices. So today we're going to be discussing biblical principles and other resources that we found useful in our practice, um, in, our, in our management and our relationships with others. So please understand that principles are not a replacement for a deep uh, relationship with Christ. As Christians, of course, our good works flow out of God's saving grace and our gratitude to Him. The use of the biblical principles uh, allows us to accomplish life-changing impacts as we rely on God's leading to manage the people and projects we've been made stewards of. So it's been our experience that applying these principles and resources has allowed us to understand ourselves, our employees, and our patients much better, and how we can honor and glorify Christ in the process. When we talk about our homes, workplaces, churches, schools, etc., the word culture is rarely mentioned. However, people typically have a clear sense that a very specific culture exists whenever a group of people become to Group of people come together for a reason. So during this workshop, you'll hear us mention culture numerous times. We've intentionally woven the concept of culture through our presentation because we have come to realize that culture shapes what is thought, said, and done each day. Although managing your practice can be a highly complex task, for the purposes of this workshop, we're going to be more focusing on three areas. Why, how, and who. For us, these three areas of discovery have revealed life-changing insights. And 
uh, helped us in when we come when we, when we try to manage the challenges that result from living life with other people. So let's start with why. Looking back at our early years, we now realize that a significant amount of our stress came from a lack of clarity regarding what our role was as Christian employers. We now come to understand that we didn't know our why. The foundational driving force for doing what we were doing or what we hoped to do. Why can also be defined as the purpose, cause, or belief that inspires people to do what they do. And our why is to grow by integrating biblical insights and inspire others to do the same. Which is what we're trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> Throughout the New Testament, Jesus demonstrated clearly that he knew his why. Everything he did flowed from his why. It motivated him in all that he did, even to the point of death on the cross. And Jesus had many diversions and distractions pulling him in all directions. And despite this, he was able to remain crystal clear on his steadfast love for mankind. And we can read in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So Jesus was very clear. And recently, we were introduced to the Hebrew word chesed, and it's H-E-S-E-D, -E -E, but you say the H for that. <laughs> like you're clearing your throat. So chesed appears over 200 times in the Old Testament, often in the Psalms. It has been translated as loving kindness, steadfast love, promise-keeping love, and mercy. It conveys a complex thought in that it combines the ideas of love and commitment wrapped up in loyalty. In a recent Daily Bread devotional, we read, Chesed is one of the richest, most powerful words in the Old Testament. It reflects the loyal love that God's people should have for one another. Chesed is not primarily something people feel. It's something people do for other people who have no claim on them. There's no equivalent word in the New Testament for Chesed, because New Testament Greek doesn't have an equivalent word. Some believe that the, at the simplest level, chesed is the heart of God for his people and the picture of his love that he intends his people to show the world. And as his people, that's us. Romans 8.38 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is unconditional, long-suffering, loyal love that we are called to live out in our interactions with the world. This is how we are to be salt and light. More specifically, in the context of our healthcare practices, we have the opportunity to demonstrate this chesed love to our patients, our teams, and our community. The love and energy we invest into our life and work determines the quality of it. The love we share in raising our children or developing employees or helping a customer impacts the final product. It sounds idyllic for this profound love to be part of any culture. God's chesed love is an overarching directive for every Christian, and it provides a framework for why we do what we do. God has intentionally built diversity into each of us. Therefore, our values and our management of our practices won't look the same. However, we believe there should be some central themes that uh, will be evident in any Christian business. Without current consideration of individual values, it's difficult to paint a picture of what it might look like for God's love to take shape in our practices. And recently we were at a CE course, and the speaker talked about values and their importance. And looking around the room, it was quite evident that many had never considered exploring their values. And values describe who we are and what we stand for. They back us up, they help guide every decision we make and define purpose, or what? Values determine how we show up, communicate, practice, and lead. And it's beneficial for values to be considered and compared when we're adding people to our practice, such as employees and associates or business partners. Everyone has values, whether they can articulate them or not. Ultimately, a practice will reflect the values of the person or people leading it. And if leadership is deferred to employees, their values will go. If you haven't done a personal values assessment or exercise to discover and clarify the top five values, uh, we can highly recommend that you do so. And we have found that it's a foundational step to building a meaningful practice that honors God and who he has made each of us to be. 
Understanding values is an extremely easy thing to overlook. But ultimately, those that embrace their clearly defined values will have a firm grip on the rudder of their lives rather than being tossed around by life's competing messages and the opinions of others. Values discovery unlocks clarity regarding specific tasks and relationships and activities that bring the most fulfillment to our lives. We're going to be looking at a couple of tables, and these tables are not all encompassing nor are the accepted management norms evident in all practices, but the points that we've listed represent general trends that we've seen over, again, in healthcare practices. In order to contrast the differences, we've looked at two extremes. However, practices often fall somewhere in between. So let's start with the value of development. The accepted norms for development in the workplace are usually limited to CE and increasing clinical knowledge for those people with licensing requirements. And little, is, little value is placed upon personal development or growth. Employees are expected to change, while often management functions with impunity where the rules of conduct don't apply to those at the top. Looking at the contrast with Christian healthcare practices, value is placed on both clinical and personal growth for all regardless of CE requirements or role in the practice. And management lives out the examples for expected conduct by walking their talk. Yeah. Another value is truth. Far too often accepted norms are questionable financial practices, rushed service or over-treatment, where treatment serves the doctor's needs more than the patient's. Unfortunately, we've heard about instances of things like marital infidelity and the tendency to spin the truth to justify personal interests. These things result in a loss of respect for the doctor and a loss of employee pride in their work. Regardless of beliefs, God's moral code is written on human hearts. People might not always know what's right, but they usually know when something's wrong. We can contrast this with Christian healthcare practices that are marked by ethical diagnosis, treatment, and billing practices, even though immediate financial gains might be sacrificed where the golden rule rules both in business practices and in relationships. And this results in patients and employees having trust in and respect for how the practice is managed and team members are proud of the place that they work. When we think about the value of service, in the world we often see self-serving approaches. We see the needs and success of the owner or shareholders overrule the other interests. And again, we look at the contrast where, uh, in healthcare management where the approach is others focused. And the goals are providing a safe environment both physically and emotionally, as well as a culture of trust. And this is extended to all employees, patients, and other customers. So, an example would be delivery people or reps that come in, essentially, everyone that we interact with. There's a quote that we came across from Simon Sinek, and he says, trust emerges when we have a sense that another person or organization is driven by things other than their own self-gain. So continuing to look at service, the world norms are typically self-centered and worldly. The goal is to get ahead, and there's often an attitude of entitlement. Priorities are earthly focused and are for short-term gain. Profit is first, people come second. In health, Christian healthcare management, service is demonstrated through Christ-centered priorities, where Christians, how Christians live their lives as a form of worship to God and a witness to others. There's a heart of prayer at the center of Christian practice. Priorities are eternally focused, and people are first in God's economy, and profit is the result of managing people well. And another quote by Simon Sinek, people are always more important than numbers. Happy people make happy numbers, which make even more people happy. <laughs> so, speaking of happy people, um, here is a photo of some of our fantastic team members. And this was taken during a recent weekend retreat, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. But hopefully you see genuine smiles, um, us being out in the community. And we're doing things that, uh, we're doing, obviously did a paint night, um, which was something outside of most of our comfort zones, but a lot of fun. Our, uh, our instructor in the middle there, she said, I can't believe how serious you guys are. <laughs> She's like, dead quiet. She was usually people that are laughing. We don't want to do a raw. No, so we serious. might have to do it a few more times. <laughs> the testimony of a Christian should never be underestimated. Uh, when we live and love like Jesus, we bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. 
It's one thing to identify a clear why, it's another thing to live it out and steadfast commitment. Jesus chose a countercultural way to live. Uh, and it often feels in our workplaces like we're swimming against the current. So Malcolm Muggeridge says, never forget that only dead fish swim with the stream. So yes, we're doing the right thing if we're swimming upstream. Full disclosure though, ever since signing up to love our people like Jesus, God has brought us employees that have needed experience in healing, hope, trust, and authentic love. Um, despite these challenges that comes, come with the world's brokenness, choosing love has stretched us and created a much deeper appreciation for God's unfailing love for us. So we've covered the importance of understanding why we do what we do and some factors that feed into that concept. So we're now going to shift to the second area of discovery, who? Who represents the people that make up our teams? And great team members are easy for you and others to love. And great team members make workplaces great because of the values and characteristics that they share with your practice culture. The more that team members have in common with your why, the easier your job will be to lead and develop them. In order to build a team of great people, it's important to have a good understanding of some employment virtues. In the book, The Ideal Team Player, um, by author and speaker Patrick Lynchoni, he provides three virtues that he feels are essential in hiring and developing ideal team players in any kind of organization. And they are humble, hungry, and smart. So I'm just going to read a summary that he provides of each of those three categories. And humble team players are quick to point out the contributions of others and slow to seek attention for their own, while not undervaluing their talents and abilities. They share credit, emphasize team over self, and define success collectively rather than individually. Looking at hungry, hungry team players are always looking for more. More things to do, more to learn, more responsibility to take on. They almost never have to be pushed by others to work harder because they're self-motivated and diligent. They're constantly thinking about the next step and the next opportunity. Smart team players have common sense about people. They tend to know what is happening in a group situation and how to deal with others in the most effective way. They have good judgment and intuition around the subtleties of group dynamics and the impact of their words and actions. So, of course, finding the perfect person is rare. And Patrick tells us that having those three attributes in balance is what we're looking for. Not all one, or not all the other, or not just two, or not just two. Um, and he goes into a lot of depth in his book, uh, talking about how those things look and how they play out and how they can be helpful or harmful, depending on what, uh, what balance they are. Um, it's said that weak companies, or there we go, weak companies hire the right experience to do the job. Strong companies hire the right person to join their team. So whenever it comes time to hire a new team member, we always find ourselves going back to the very valuable and sometimes frustrating principle of hire slow, fire fast. So we're going to talk about hire slow first. As we've already mentioned, we're looking for humble, hungry, and smart team candidates. But also during the hiring <coughs> process, we're sure to determine what strengths and talents are needed for that particular role. And we also want to look at each candidate's ability to do the job and how they're going to interact with the other personalities on the team. We've found that it is critically important, no matter how urgent the vacancy is, that we take the time to thoroughly check references. It's something that's being um, done less and less now. And uh, we also do multiple in-depth interviews, and if possible, we do working interviews, no matter what position that we're hiring for. And there are some very effective techniques that you can use for getting the most out of the hiring process and discover potential red flags before offering someone a position. It is definitely more work to take these steps, much more time consuming, but we reap what we sow. And we believe that it's well worth it to hire slow. Mm -hmm. So looking at, conversely, we need to fire fast. When someone isn't working out or is actively causing disruption in the team, it requires the business owner to be courageous. The Bible always encourages us to talk directly to the person that's causing division or strife and help them to understand what the impact of their behavior is, as well as the possible consequences if it doesn't continue, or sorry, if it continues. 
Discernment is key during this time because many desirable employee attributes can be temporarily encouraged by discipline and deadlines, but ultimately, if there's not authentic change, it won't last. There's a tremendous potential, tremendous potential to live in fear when it comes to the possibility of firing an employee. It is much easier to convince yourself that it's not that bad. I'll try a different approach again. At least I know the faults of this individual. What, who knows what I'll end up with hiring somebody new. And there's no one that knows how to do the job. So I have said all of these and many more, but the reality is no one is irreplaceable. Toxic is toxic. And worse than that, toxic is contagious. So on a number of occasions, we've found ourselves in the unenviable position of needing to let an employee be free to find success elsewhere. Early on in the process, we've learned to seek the expertise of an employment lawyer. And of course, this has cost some money, both in legal costs and severance, but it has saved us many layers of stomach lining and cost in the long run. Yeah. To be free from the workplace toxicity, uh, not only for us as employers, but also for our engaged team members, is invaluable. A bad apple truly can spoil a bunch. So it always feels bad, but you can actively choose to fire someone and still be a good Christian. Uh, Jesus practiced tough love on many occasions. Being a Christian doesn't equal being a doormat, and good boundaries are essential. For people that really deeply care about others, setting boundaries can be tough. Most people know they need to set boundaries, but very few know how to do it well. Some are so afraid that they don't even try to set boundaries. Others try and fail dismally. And still others do it in a way that does more damage than good. So for these reasons, people often put off setting boundaries, as well as avoid having difficult conversations. This avoidance causes relationships to suffer. But we need to remind ourselves that God has boundaries. He is clear on who he is, what he is for, and what he is against. He's for relationship, truth, love, and honesty. He's against oppression, injustice, sin, and evil. And we are called to love what God loves and hate what God hates. And we recently came across a concept of the need to understand how to integrate grace, which is obviously unconditional, with employment requirements, which are conditional. So when people enter into an employment agreement, they are abiding, they are agreeing to abide by the workplace conditions and requirements, just as we are agreeing to pay them for the work that they do. And sometimes, despite offering employees numerous opportunities to get on board with your culture and your values, they refuse to truly get on the bus. And it's okay if people decide that they don't want to be on your bus. But then you have to realize that they need to get off the bus. If you don't, your team will suffer. And they need to be free to find the bus that suits them. Scripture says they will know we are Christians by our love. And sometimes that means a pat on the back. And sometimes it means sitting and listening with empathy. And other times it means the right thing might be to end someone's employment. And it can, if it's done properly, be done with love and without shame. If, as leaders, we shirk our responsibilities, we will be left with only the poorly behaved employees because the great ones will say they've had enough and find ways to leave. And if we refuse to act when appropriate, we compromise our culture, but more than that, we compromise our Christian witness. We've seen that happen. Uh, we've almost gone there, you know, we've realized it. Uh, but it can be tough. So by maximizing those three values we talked about, humble, hum, hungry, humble, hungry, and smart, sorry, I had too many cookies, <laughs> and uh, applying the high, higher, fast, slow, uh, higher, slow, fire, fast principle, the path to creating a healthy workplace culture is much easier to navigate. So let's talk about some key points that uh, will help us understand what a healthy team culture looks like. So first point, culture is going to happen no matter what. <laughs> Without intentional leadership by the practice owner, 
Culture will be determined by the employees with the strongest personalities, and that culture will reflect the values of those individuals. The greatest transformative work needs to occur in the heart of the leader. For the Christian healthcare practice owner, this heart transformation work is done through their obedience to Christ. The process is neither automatic nor without sacrifice. We are most definitely called to be saved, but we are also called to be transformed. If you want to lead a group of great team players, you need to be a great leader. And leaders can't fake healthy culture. Leaders need to walk their talk. Everything that you want to see in your employees and team members, you need to be living out yourself or at least working on. You can't grow your people if you aren't growing yourself. When the leader is committed to growth, others do follow. The behaviors that support a healthy team culture are contagious to others, both in the workplace and beyond. Focusing energy and effort on healthy team culture creates an environment for engaged people to do meaningful and purposeful work together. So we've discussed the importance of understanding why we do what we do and who we do it and what we do with and uh, who we hire. Ideal team players who are humble, hungry, and smart and have values that align with ours. Once our why is clear and our who are in place, we need we are ready to focus on how uh, we build that culture that serves those we serve. There are no shortcuts to creating a healthy team culture, and often workplaces that talk about culture fail to follow through and invest time or energy into fostering it. They expect their employees to be their best uh, and exhibit great performance, but they miss opportunities to help their employees to understand their strengths and don't invest the necessary effort into creating environments that fuel development and collaboration. All the strategy in the world will not make up for a poor culture. It's been said, culture needs strategy for breakfast. <laughs> or, put another way, uh, a lot of organizations focus on strategy and ignore culture, yet culture trumps strategy every time. So that's a quote by John Gordon, and John Gordon is also an author and a speaker, and he writes parable-style books that are easy to read and filled with valuable insights. And our team has really enjoyed reading a number of his books. He is a Christian, but he doesn't quote chapter and verse in his writing. In one of his books, Soup, he discusses ways to nourish teams and culture. And in speaking about culture, this is what John says. It requires a lot of work up front, but not as much work as dealing with the crises, problems, and challenges associated with negative, dysfunctional, and subpar cultures. While most organizations waste a lot of time putting out fires, you can spend your time building a great organization. So for us, key characteristics of a healthy culture are where all team members have mutual respect for each other, are cross-trained wherever possible, participate in healthy collaboration. It's where they know their ideas are important and welcome. Uh, they get to offer and implement solutions to problems and pitfalls in their company. They know that their strengths are an essential part of our well-balanced team. They experience emotional and physical safety, where they feel valued and experience appreciation from, for, from each other for who they are more than what they do. And this is appreciation versus recognition. We're going to touch on that a little bit. They have trust with each other. They know their mistakes are accepted, but their excuses are not. They feel they're part of something bigger than just a paycheck, and they feel a sense of belonging and, and community. And it's been said that for thousands of years, people were born into a community and spend their life trying to figure out what it meant to be an individual. Now, everyone is born as an individual and spends their lifetime trying to find community. They wouldn't tell us who said that, but it, it was, it was it's out there. Apparently, it's an anonymous Hollywood figure. There's another quote that we came across uh, in regards to mistakes. It's not how we make mistakes, but how we correct them that defines us. The way that we handle our mistakes shows our teachability, our approachability, and our trustworthiness to those around us, both at work and beyond. And there is no faster way to lose respect in the eyes of others than to make excuses or place blame for our mistakes. In contrast, we build trust with others when they see us taking responsibility and ownership for our mistakes. And the truth will set us free. So we believe mistakes are inevitable. 
Everyone is human and they make mistakes. So let's take responsibility for mistakes, let's learn from mistakes, let's undertake changes that benefit all those involved. Let's be remorseful and make restitution where necessary. We make sure that our team experiences forgiveness when they make mistakes. It's important to note that if someone feels they're not making mistakes, they're either out of touch with reality or maybe they're not trying to. Now, as the boss, uh, it's often a really big deal if we make big mistakes. And of course, we always work hard enough to do that. Uh, but even when little mistakes happen, by being real with our team about the missteps that we take, we can open up the door for us to be really real with them, both about ourselves and our faith. Rather than team members feeling that they are, we are above them because of our faith or our position, they see that there's common ground, and they're more willing to share about their highs and lows. In addition to managing mistakes, dealing with problem behaviors is much easier when we have clear and specific job descriptions along with employee agreements. This ensures that expectations are, um, sorry, that expectations and responsibilities are clear from the outset, rather than being left to be assumed. While clear and specific job descriptions and employment agreements might seem overly formal, uh, we found that they are essential in providing a solid foundation for both employers and employees to work on. Uh, without them, there's potential for stress as both parties will have different perspectives and expectations on how the job should be, got, should be done. There are reams of ideas on leadership, uh, but in the interest of time, we're going to just share a few of the things that reflect the current leadership priorities in our So we commit to having a clear understanding of our values and communicating them to the team. We also commit to being accessible and approachable. Providing resources and support for growth for ourselves and the entire team. We train our people on their job tasks. And this sounds like a no-brainer, but often new employees are left to figure things out for themselves. Not a good strategy. Training our people to discover and celebrate their strengths. We also avoid snoopervising. Oh. Oh, sorry, trusting and upholding the decisions of our people. We also avoid something called supervising, which is a helicopter type approach of managing. And it doesn't empower people uh, to perform their best. Learning to be comfortable with delegating tasks, very hard to do. But especially those that are outside of our skill set, we need to delegate. And we need to remember as business owners, we are still responsible to lead. So we delegate, but we don't abdicate. <laughs> Looking for leaders amongst our people and embracing opportunities to give them more responsibility and the authority to exercise it. Often people are given more responsibility, but not the authority that goes with it. And praying. Praying is key. And by enlisting others to be part of the prayer support, we have found that that's been tremendously beneficial. So prayer provides us with protection, and it allows others to partner in kingdom work. It also provides fertile ground for opening doors, and it helps us to live with Christ-centered integrity. The Jesus we portray may be the only Jesus we will encounter. Our actions speak louder than our words ever will. This is where integrity and a life that's in line with our Christian values really hits the road. Nothing is more important for our witness than having a solid character founded on Christian morals. Integrity and morality are non-negotiables and need to be consistent across every aspect of our lives. It's been said anyone could be a leader if there was no cost. But true leaders willingly pay a price to sacrifice self-interest to have the honor to lead. So it's important to be alert to the fact that when we are under stress, our minds naturally gravitate towards temptation. And I don't know about you, but under, in my job, I'm often under stress. A really good uh, section on this came from Pastor Wayne Cordero's book, Leading on Empty. He shares candidly about putting his integrity into action. He says, there must be certain pilings driven so deeply into my soul that at times of crisis they will serve as immovable, unquestionable anchors in my life. If I haven't firmly made up my mind and established my convictions before I come up against any such situations, they may very well become options. 
This is an important step in guarding our hearts and minds and protecting those we love. The world is watching everything we say and do. Sadly, there are many examples of poor behavior exhibited by Christians. How about those Christian patients who don't keep their appointments or come late, don't pay their bills, rant and rave, cause great stress for our employees? Those times can be very disheartening. We're always under surveillance by our employees, our patients. They watch how we go through struggles in parenting, health, marriage, grief, disappointment, and loss. They watch our relationships with friends and colleagues, especially those that are Christians, as their unresolved conflict, backstabbing, gossip. They watch our relationships with our spouses. Is there a lack of respect or integrity, commitment? Is there unhealthy conflict? We want people around us to be drawn to Christianity, not pushed away. So we found that investing time and energy and finances into personal growth not only improves team dynamics, but it also results in healthy relationships outside of the clinic as well. And we came across this quote quite a while ago, and it's, we judge ourselves by our intentions we judge others by their behavior. And that's a really significant thing to consider and ponder. When we're, when we're finding ourselves in those tense situations, are we judging ourselves by a different standard than we're judging others? Early in our marriage, we did a quick personality assessment at a CE lecture of all places. And before this, we could never understand why our differences were such stress points in our relationship. Uh, for instance, when we travel, well, well sure. <laughs> when we travel, um, I would arrive at the hotel and gather up all the brochures. This is this is this hotel, and I just just <laughs> had to take this picture of this story. But I we would I would gather up all the brochures and figure out all of the things that we could do. And then we go up to her room, and Dave would plump down on the bed, grab the remote in hand, and start relaxing. And I would look at him, why don't you care about our vacation? And he would look at me as, why don't you care about our vacation? Um, and the, the funny thing was, I, I don't do that so much anymore, um, but I felt the pull. The moment he walked into this hotel, I did, I felt the pull. Um, so it's still there. Even though you grow, it's still there. It still wants to pull you back in. But as you can imagine, I'm sure that you can imagine that wasn't a good way to start a vacation. <laughs> she still reads all the literature that's in the book. Yeah. But, uh, during that CE course, we realized that not being the same was a good thing. And later on, we realized that our differences actually complemented each other and we were actually a god thing. So this helped us celebrate our differences and strengthen our appreciation for one another rather than it being a point of tension and judgment. And scripture supports that differences are part of God's, God's plan, things we can celebrate rather than things we need to endure. God's given us all gifts and talents, as well as our unique personality traits, and these are resources that are to be used for his glory. So being good stewards of the resources God's blessed us with helps us live richer lives infused with joy, peace, and of course deeper meaning. And every person on a team is a remarkable resource, and more specifically, all of the unique qualities they, they possess are also resources. So the diverse mix of personalities, talents, strengths weave together to form the big picture of how an office culture will look. So we try to begin with the end in mind, to see someone's potential and support them to realize it. It's been said that normal is what I like to do. And many times people simply don't realize that their normal is actually something special and unique to offer others. So we use assessments to help steward the unique talents and strengths of those on our team. Uh, and empower them by celebrating just how special their contribution to the team can be. So we are going to highlight a few of the assessments that we've used. We're not highlighting all of them, but we'll highlight a few of them. And before I get into that, I want to reiterate how faithful God has been. We would pray for God's leading, and he would point us to the resource that we needed. And some of them came from unlikely places. Um, I remember one time we were really searching on love, God's love, and we kept seeing love, and, and we were in a Miami airport, and there's this big display of love, like it was as big as this room, and we just thought, wow, you know, God is just continuing to point us to, to, to messages and tools and resources. Um, with the exception of the Bible, no one author has it all figured out, and so we needed the Holy Spirit's leading to discern which concepts were in line with God's truth. And we've done our best to follow 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things, and hold fast to what is good. 
So the first assessment I'll point out is StrengthsFinder 2.0. It's Tom Rath um, is the author, and it's through the Gallup uh, organization in the United States. So some people have heard of Gallup polls. Well, that's one of the branches of the Gallup organization. And they were actually founded on Christian principles decades ago. And they still have a faith component in operation today. This assessment celebrates each one's uniqueness and talents. And it's not about what's wrong or deficient with people. Don Gordon says a team with talent can be good, but they must come together to be great. And so we found that this assessment has been amazingly reliable and also empowering as employees can see what they have to offer and develop that. And as John Gordon says, or suggests, they can come together to be a great team. DISC, DISC or DISC type assessments, uh, the one that we did early on in our marriage was a DISC type assessment, and it has huge benefits. Um, it helps participants understand themselves and others better and learn, again, as we said, that differing styles and partnering together is a good thing, whether it be at home or at work. We also know that stress is common in healthcare, and there is an assessment called the Berkman Assessment, and it actually highlights how differently people behave when stressed. And we actually did this years ago as part of a workshop that was facilitated by uh, John Palmer, who was a former CMBS past president. So, that was a great opportunity for our team. And many of you are familiar with the Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. It's been around for longer than we've been married, so it's been around for a long time. And we loved the tool. We thought it was incredibly effective in helping us understand each other better. And so we changed all the questions so that we could use it on our team. And they thought it was great. And then all of a sudden, this resource came out <laughs> years later. Um, and so this has been a modified version of the five love languages so that it's appropriate for a workplace. And one of the ways that we feel that you uh, can initiate a positive culture shift is to improve the frequency and the effectiveness of teammates demonstrating appreciation to one another, both in small ways and big ways. And as we alluded to earlier, we want to point out that there is a difference between appreciation and recognition. And this is something that we recently came across. We listened to a talk that highlighted this. And appreciation says you're a good person and these are the reasons why. Recognition says the thing you did was good. And there's a de de definite distinction between those in terms of the impact that it has on people. And it's not that recognition is, is a bad thing. Uh, it's still very good, very effective in the management. But it's, it's also important to realize that people want to know that they're good not necessarily linked to what they do, but they're just good people. So appreciation is always more effective in motivating um, than recognition is. Yeah, and some other helpful assessments that we've used, uh, once again, Patrick and Joni, five dysfunctions of a team. Um, it helps identify strength and weakness in five key areas of team development. It sort of looks at the whole team and shows you where you're doing well and where you need to uh, pull things up. Uh, we've also used Stephen Covey's speed of trust assessments that identify behaviors that inhibit and build uh, trust on your team. Um, and we've also found that if you don't have a good foundation of trust, most of the other stuff you're going to try and do is not going to work. Uh, if that piece is missing, you know, it's like trying to lead a healthy lifestyle while smoking. It just doesn't work. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. The last one that I'll mention is doing a personal conflict style assessment. Uh, we did a team workshop a number of years ago facilitated by a good friend of ours and conflict coach, Alan Simpson. And uh, he used this tool in helping our team better understand ourselves, um, each other, and to improve how we communicate and deal with conflict. We found out we were all avoiders. And so uh, we have a little bit of work to do. Uh, many of us live in two worlds when it comes to relationships. In one world, we have friendly conversations, which we avoid all disagreements. And in the other world, we have major conflict-type uh, conversations that tear everybody and everything up. Uh, in the first, we have connection without truth. And in the second, we have truth without connections. God did not design us to live in either of these two worlds. He wants us to live in the same world that he lives in, where truth and love coexist as allies and adversaries. So as we continue to discuss the hows of managing our practices, Effective communication is another foundational aspect of healthy team cultures. So George Bernard Shaw, 
He's quoted as saying, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And we have found that when there's a communication void, people will automatically fill in the blanks with inaccurate and negative thoughts. People are prone to assume the worst. Not everybody, but many are. And then, unfortunately, people act on those assumptions. Fear creeps in, and that impact impacts thoughts, behaviors, and actions. Back to John Gordon again, he says, communication builds trust, and it is the key to any successful family or team. So we have built in regular practical opportunities for effective and frequent communication in our practice. And with some creativity, these, these can be um, applied in most settings. So we do a five, five to ten minute morning meeting before we start our patients, and it's to get everyone on the same page for the day. And, and more, than, more than figuring out strategy in terms of, of patients, um, it also is connecting to find out how people are feeling or doing. And that allows people to be able to adjust and shift a little bit. If somebody is down a little bit, um, somebody else can step up and, and kind of cover for them a little bit better if, than if they weren't upfront about how they were feeling. The other thing that we do is uh, something called a touch base meeting. And that's like a 10 or 20 minute uh, weekly or bi-weekly meeting that's done individually. And what that does is it builds relationships with team members. And it allows the team members to feel safe to both voice things, but also to hear about things. And so often we have found as well that these, these little connections can sometimes become uh, great opportunities for coaching as well. Uh, we also do one-day workshops throughout the year. We have annual team re retreats over a weekend. Um, that paint night would happen to coincide with something like a, a weekend retreat. Uh, monthly team meetings over lunch hour, and departmental meetings um, when, when necessary. We also are in the habit of expressing gratitude as a key form of communication. So we praise people. Um, we praise the behavior we want to see more of. We catch people doing things right. We also use the appreciation languages tool um, to more effectively communicate and show appreciation. We also celebrate the things that go well. We call them celebrating victories. We celebrate the things that go well. So if a patient um, mentions something to maybe one of our receptionists or one of our clinical team members, they, they, they pass that on. They don't just take it. Um, and they, they just share it. And it just, it just uplifts everybody. Uh, we celebrate what we get to do rather than focus on what we have to do. Very big difference. Um, and there's a benefit to doing something called gratitude exercises. And there's a whole different um, range of, of ways that you can do those. But they push people to focus on the positives. And if we look at scripture, it's pretty clear. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I think God is in support of us being grateful. And not surprisingly, there's lots of research that identifies gratitude as one of the key foundational disciplines for those who want to be happy. Uh, so you can't be stressed and grateful at the same time. Anybody can? I'd like to know. It's so exciting which research backs up timeless biblical principles. This is just one of the many significant truths that as Christian business owners we can share with the team members without being in the delicate position of crossing the line of combining faith. Uh, communication can also take place in written form as well. In our office, we create written SOPs, or standard operating procedures. They communicate why we do the procedure, the key steps in each task, and they also provide a standard for accuracy and efficiency. They're also really useful for training new team members because there's no doubt that they can go through the steps and get to where they need to go. Two additional key qualities of communication we don't want to leave out are authenticity and transparency. And when communication involves these two, people's trust increases. People believe in you and are much more likely to follow your lead. As I mentioned earlier, in order to have real communication, you need to be real with the people around you. Being clear on upcoming changes and letting people know where they stand are key. A huge motivator for all of us is fear. And allowing a safe place for team members to share their fears is also essential. Shame and vulnerability researcher Brene Brown uh, says, leaders must either invest a reasonable amount of time attending to fears and feelings or squander an unreasonable amount of 
of time, trying to manage ineffective and unproductive behavior. But effective communication is not only the things that we say and how we say them, it also includes how we listen. So we have found that to listen is to love. If we're not listening, we're not only being ineffective with our communication, but we are being unloving. And I came across this quote that I thought was really great. Listening is not necessarily about changing your mind, but it will transform the way you move through the world with others. And it's good to remember that most of the time, when we're engaging in dialogue with others, it's not absolute truth that's on the line. It's just a sharing of perspectives, albeit sometimes very different perspectives. Having this in mind can help us keep our emotions in check, not be as reactive, and not take ourselves and others too seriously. Richard Carlson is best known for his Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books, but he also wrote a book called You Can Be Happy No Matter What. And in his book, he encourages us to listen without judgment, and the person you are with will sense your respect for their position and your willingness to listen. When your attention is primarily in the present moment, the bulk of your experience comes from a place of wisdom rather than reactivity. So, listen, so listening without judgment is key. You've probably heard it said that if you're thinking about what you're going to say next, you're not listening. When considering the hows of men, we smile because that's something. <laughs> uh, so when considering the hows of managing your practice, we're not only needing to focus on the hows of managing our people, we need to be aware of the importance of managing ourselves. This is the vision requirement. In pra and in particular, we want to mention two things, the stewardship of our time and the stewardship of our finances. So let's look at the stewardship of time. This involves having both work, rest, and play in balance in our lives. One of the primary speakers for the CMDS conference a few years ago was Pastor Mark Buchanan. And uh, he shared that having a Sabbath heart and taking Sabbath rest are key non emotions. And we found his book, The Rest of God, to be a great help in understanding what God defines Sabbath to be. It was a real eye opener. Uh, we've seen that we let Sabbath, but when we let Sabbath slip, burnout becomes a reality. Goodbye, Sabbath. Hello, burnout. An excellent book for hope of hope for Christians, either in burnout or close to it, is the book I referred to previously, uh, Leading on Empty by Wayne Guerrero. Uh, one of the practical ways we've introduced the concept of Sabbath into our dental office is that we've intentionally factored in wellness days throughout the year, where the clinic is closed and our team are encouraged to do things that are restorative. And of course, this is a clearly countercultural approach because it's really not helping the bottom line. Um, but it sends a clear message to the team that we walk our talk and we value their well-being. On the topic of the stewardship of finances, there are many biblical references to money, but two in particular come to mind, and this is the first one. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. God loves a cheerful giver. And do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, we strive to be good stewards of our finances, but we do need to guard ourselves against an unhealthy focus on money. And Dave and I believe that being consumed with our finances will not get us to where we really want to be. And that being said, of course, we do feel it is important to live with financial responsibility and when debt occurs to manage it responsibly by having a plan to decrease it as quickly as possible. We also feel that tithing to support kingdom work is not optional, and it's the starting off point for giving back to God. We can't help give God. We've seen colleagues find themselves in compromising positions because they've not managed their finances well. And this snare puts them in the situation of having a great temptation to compromise their business practices in order to cover expenses, not to mention the strain that it puts on marriages and families. So we all know that vital signs are essential in determining the level of health of our patients. So, is there a similar way to quickly assess the level of cultural health in our practices? So we're going to have a list now, and so the presence or absence of the items that are in the list, we believe, are indicative of the level of health or disease from a, cult, uh, from a um, cultural health perspective in our workplaces, and can point us in the direction of what course of action we might need to take. So, gossip, venting, backbiting power struggles, ignoring others' boundaries, 
having a that's not my job mentality, being reactive versus proactive, managing conflict poorly, causing an emotionally unsafe environment, ineffective or absent communication, having unrealistic expectations, and complacency in terms of not putting into practice the things that we have learned. So if we look at that list and we're aware of one or more of those common barriers that are ongoing in a working environment, it's highly probable that there's toxicity that needs to be dealt with. And again, it's not okay to ignore behaviors that are hurtful, disruptive, or threatening to others. And looking back at, at John Gordon's book, Soup Again, he has this quote that I thought was quite powerful. One negative employee can pollute the entire team and create a toxic work environment. One employee in a bad mood can turn off and turn away countless customers, and pervasive negative attitudes can sabotage the morale and performance of a team with plenty of talent and potential. So we found that it's, it can be difficult to discover the origin of behaviors that can undermine a good culture. And so sometimes some very savvy detective work and prayer are the best tools for discovery in terms of what's really going on. Yeah. Now, don't be tempted to think that just hiring Christians will guarantee that your employees will embrace your why and sustain a culture that supports what you believe. We know many Christians that would be comfortable in our environment. Um, but we also feel it's important to share that the majority of our team members present are also not committed Christians. We are clear with our team about what we believe, and we're also clear that sharing our Christian beliefs is not a requirement for working with us. In Canada, our provincial employment set governing bodies consider it inappropriate for employers to teach from the Bible or any other book of faith, but there are no rules barring us from appropriately caring for, encouraging, and teaching our people so that they grow in maturity and have happier, more productive lives, both at work and at home. So, I hope you think now that we believe that it's worth the energy and the effort and the financial investment to build and maintain a god honoring culture in our workplace. Don't get us wrong, it is not quick and it's not an easy thing to do. In order to make the necessary changes, we had to earnestly and deliberately search out answers to our questions and learn things that we had not been taught in digital school. And the management skills that we have needed have not been automatic or natural just because we're Christians. Sustaining this culture, sustaining a positive culture, requires continuous effort and commitment. And we believe it's also required much prayer. But if we look at what Jesus did in his years of ministry, he was committed to creating a sustainable culture, and he started with 12, and now the whole world is hearing about opportunities to live an abundant life in him. As leaders, we have to prioritize our relationship with Christ above our management and relational challenges. God's principles will only realize their full impact when they flow through us according to his plan for our lives. Again, full disclosure, this is an area we're still working on. This proactive stance is a paradigm shift where we are discovering fresh nuances all the time. Satan wants us busy, preoccupied, and reactive, stressed out, strung out, and tired out. God wants us focused on him, calmly going through our days centered and able to share his wisdom to the lost world around us, able to sit with them in times of pain and ready to offer the hope and love that comes from knowing him. We realize this has been a little bit like making from a fire hose, uh, with a lot of information in a short period of time. But if you're excited about what we've shared today and want more information on how to begin or if you need encouragement to carry on, we're happy to share anything we can that might help. We know we have much more to learn on this subject, so we love hearing from others what they've found helpful in shaping their workplaces to be part of the kingdom and a reflection of God's love. And so this brings us to the end of our presentation. I want to thank you for uh, joining us to hear a few things that God's taught us over the years. We hope you've seen that it's most, most definitely worth it to spend your time to discover your why and who and how uh, in order to build and manage a culture that will allow you to manage your healthcare practice to authentically reflect what we